So we'll stop that song now. So that was Daka Braca, and it's a band out of the Ukraine. And the women have been singing together since they were four years old. Uh, and hi, I'm Emily Wallace Hughes, editorial co director of Fence with Jason Zuzga. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Jason to say a few things. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so um, this is a substantially long event. So as you uh, would like, feel free to uh, get up and walk around, listen to it in the background, you know, leave, come back, whatever you need to do. and. I expect uh, there will be uh, people coming in later, and um, that should be it. it should be uh, a great event. We've got an array of amazing performers for you, uh, musicians, um, memoirists, poets, translators and we couldn't be more excited. We're also extremely excited about the auction where uh, we've now uh, had our bids are at about $18,500, which is fantastic. So another thing that would be great for you to do is we're going to uh, check in on the auction occasionally and in a moment, we're going to show you a few um, videos from the auction. And um, I'll put the, the link in the chat just so you have it. And feel, feel free to uh, you know, continue listening and go wander about in the bazaar. And um, we will keep going. Um, I just wanted to read a quote I had just gotten from uh, uh, from Ron Silliman. Um, I, I bumped into Ron Silliman, the poet, at an event at the Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania. And I overheard him saying something to Matt Lutwin, who is among the people here. And I wrote to Ron and asked if he would write down some approximation of what he had said. And he wrote, um, for two dozen years, Fence has been one of the primary journals of poetry and literature in the United States. Perhaps because it started with a plague on both your houses approach to American literary formations it has manifested a post-tendency 21st century perspective with both openness and nuance. It's pretty much perfect for these times. 
So we're glad to have such a blurb. And um, we will, and I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to Emily, right? Yes. And welcome to those of you who also just joined us. So I'm doing um, a screen share here. And um, we thought it would be fun to share you this video that Anthony Madrid made. And Anthony Madrid is pretty much the most serious fountain pen enthusiast I know. <laughs> and he's also a brilliant poet and he's editor of The Constant Critic with Tyrone Williams. Uh, he also made me this mini flag book and he writes letters and he makes his own stationery with fountain pens. Uh, and you can see here, there are deliberate inaccuracies and there are mistakes. I'm not trying to make a point with any of this. <laughs> so uh, we'll share and watch the video now. This is the artifact, the flag book, and I'll page through it. It's not bound with any kind of thread or anything. A little book of flag improvisations with a note at the end, explanation, and a little thing showing my location. These are some of the pens that were used to make it. It's all done with fountain pen ink and with vintage mechanical pencils that look like that. And that's it. And that was Anthony Madrid in the video as well. Uh, so you can check this out if you're interested. Okay. And um, let's see, I'm going to show you another video. Um, this is from our fiction editor, Harris Lati. And there's been a little bit of a bidding war on it today. So let's, let's see where it is. See, there it is, it's hidden in the, my corner. All right, so Harris Lottie is also a uh, professional house painter as well as an accomplished fiction writer. And he has, uh, so, so the bid started at 100 and it's already up to next minimum bid 260. So Harris is, uh, very excited right now. And um, here's here's the video he made for us. Um, it's a it's a meditative, uh, contemplative video. So allow yourself to relax, uh, lean back, listen to the sounds, and be overwhelmed by the motion of the brush.
All right. So if you do watch this video, you'll get to see a lot of other things about fence, fence staining. Look, here's fence. Um, and I want to show you uh, one last thing, which is uh, a bit of performance by the band Matmos, um, which is a, a kind of experimental electronica band. And uh, they um, met when one of them was go-go dancer, the other an attendee at the bar. And um, hold on, that's not it. And uh, they've been married, you know, for a long time and a band for a long time. Uh, one of their early albums was all made out of recorded plastic surgery sounds. And um, one of their recent albums that's available to be bid on is uh, Ultimate Care 2, which is, um, let's see, which is made entirely uh, using their laundry machine um, that they've used for the past like 15, 18 years in their basement. And they went on tour and uh, brought their washing machine with them, hooked it up to tubes on stage, had hundreds of buckets, and they ran the washing machine for one cycle, which is the length of the album. Um, so the, the album begins by pushing the start button on the washing machine, and then they make sounds with the washing machine. So I'll just show you a bit of that. And, and I went to see them live, and it was an amazing, you know, you know, dancey performance. So what, you know, I hope this makes you feel, uh, and Ultimate Care 2 is the name of their washing machine. That's the model. So all the sounds that you hear there are all sampled sounds made originally by the washing machine or using the washing machine as an instrument. Um, and that's, that's enough for our preview, you know, the previews section of the evening. Um, but we do, you know, all these three things are available to be bid on in the auction. And, you know, we hope you'll check it out. We did get a last minute, literally last minute donation um, from the artist Richard Prince of a painting that is val given its value has a minimum bid of $20,000. So if you, any of you are feeling a little bit wild and abandoned, mm -hmm. right, um, you might wanna consider bidding on it um, or you might uh, want to think over who you're, if you've ever met, you know, a wealthy art collector and, you know, let them know about it. But, uh, and that's why the auction is extended until Friday night at 11.59 PM. So I'm gonna stop my share and turn it over to Emily. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so we're gonna get started with our performances. And first we have Harmony Holiday. Uh, so I met Harmony Holiday for the first time at Torn Page in Chelsea. Uh, that's also where Leanne Brown lives and she'll be with us later. Uh, and that was more than several years ago now. Uh, and I remember her reading from Hollywood Forever, which is one of her fence books. 
Uh, her new book is Ma'afa, which I have read and reread. Uh, when I think of harmony, I think of courage, among many other things, but I do sincerely think of courage. Um, and I'm reminded of these lines from Ma'afa, I used to be afraid to swallow anything but blood and grapes, and so we can heal backwards. I asked Armini what she's been reading and watching lately, and she recommends uh, Margot Jefferson's book, Constructing a Nervous System, and a new film on Monk called Rewind Play by a French director named Alan Gomi. And here's Harmony. Thank you, Emily. Um, thanks for putting this together. Fence is so important. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes. I'm just glad that we're coming together for this because it's fun to read and Fence is a very needed contribution to the world of poetry publishing. I think especially now, um, I think speaking of courage, I also think of courage in relation to this press and it's many, many years of publishing you know, genre bending, as they say, uh, work in all forms and what that's allowed uh, writers like myself and many, many others um, to go and do with our lives, what we love. So I'm, I'm torn. I was gonna like, I'm just home from like teaching for a lot of the day. So I'm, I've am i been talking a lot. So I was gonna read new stuff, but I might actually just um, read semi new stuff that I've already read and then a bit from Mafa since it is out recently on Fence. So I think, I think I'm gonna do that. And what for like 15 minutes or something? 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Whatever feels good. Sounds good. Um, all right, I'll just start and improvise as we do. So this is called Motherless Empire from Mafa. These are my obsessions seduced into a second childhood, not because I want to correct something, but because Bess is more seductive as a runner than a whore. A praise dance like the ones we did in the mirror with Aunt Viv. Nothing referential this second time around, no references from commercial enterprise, nothing but the soil, the crop, the house, our bodies, our second skin, that phallic hypocrisy of sweet baby girl looking for reflective water in the fraying dust. Sometimes I feel that way and am that way. One piece of cloth for every piece of cloth I weave and bleach into statement in the sun and stain and the circus juice of berries, everything that is mine this time I am making. Rebirth can only come of this desire to take what's yours and embroider it with the code of first witness. This is my godless land, my country, my obsessive fantasy about the corner of a missing smile found in the owl's eyes, smirking, calling the mouth a liability, crackling the night with blurry accusations, weeping out of pity for the devil until what was, com what was compulsive split to slow moan, boat song, song of the recovered darkness. Song of how we longed for that dayless day in secret. Song of how we killed it in a public square while its soul ran off into the eagle heretic. There is a power only silence chases in a language of pure gesture between dance and birth and no nation can claim it. And have you been the unmothered skin of early sky and bondage bound to a land as you torched it? Not that we thought about leisure as a way of looking, seeming, Mingus, I love you. Not that we even had a word for it to give it form, not that struggle became a home, a form we could trust and ease an evil and enemy prickly unknown, unknowable then. Not that it was riveting to have one enemy with no name, no passion, but freedom run, reign, some ransom. Not that they were so free they believed in nothing, so they're, teach so they're teaching them to work with their hands and the whole motion of the figure. Figure is torment. Not that torment as a gesture is a black man laughing in rehearsal for the minstrel. What happened between her and her angel that made her change her name, I told Jesus. Pink satin, helpless response to a miracle. 
Not that I'm interrogating the sun and pretending to save it. Mafa of the criminalized sun on Sunday, we wonder about her in a humble room and dance the blank beat forward. Not that I feel futile, or was it servile, evil as a ghost of the future? My perception, my delusion, my way of naming the labor, their total availability, vitality, a deity is a personification of a spiritual power and deities who have not been recognized become demons and dangerous. Mafa, God of wished for danger, of excuses, of range, day in her night in her. Not that the healer needs an image or publicity or cohesion, not that the massacre becoming imaginary camaraderie to have witnessed the massacre of our own families, nobody recovers these, no. Nor we certainly, not, nor that we certainly laugh a lot at our own witnessing, at being owned property of to keep from like hostages are kept not like brides or blacks are kept crying, somebody weep. Not that it wasn't busy happening, guzzling the sound of our mirth for adventure is what she calls little inherited trauma, re-enters inertia, renters inertia. When struggle gets boring and her name ornamental ma, my mouth can't turn her into mirrors. Not that you can attack a disaster, she will turn into a city here, an underworld gone over, over. Let's see. Monsters of Innocence. She has a statue stacked flat on their backs in the coffin warehouse, a pout of serial numbers and glaucoma. At least that's what she tells mama while lighting the next blunt and humming some soul survival was so funny and incantatory. Two astronaut statues pressed to my ears while I sing Malcolm's Valentine. It's hard to understand time when you're within a poem. <laughs> like, has it been five minutes or two? You know, when you're reading, you kind of can't tell. But I'm just going to read um, a little from the last section and segue into some newer stuff. All right, this is the section in the book. It's a four section called The Paradise of Ruins, and it's trying to uh, relish and like ruin stuff. Um, there are things we say for style and beat that we'll regret for real. About the girl with a firearm in the background, do you think you can rule the world on a bluff? Be ominous with me for a moment. Be omniscient in this music with me, grieving the decency, that feeble decency blockbuster slave movie. Trauma sells better than sex, but slavery sells best. And genocide is always organized, usually by the state. So my slaves eat weedies, everything worthwhile is improvising. The tangle of pathology, Molly, love child, and I'm a leave middleman got together, traded betmonts and genders, but Moesha's brother is still missing. Even the fictions are dysfunctional. So what do you mean flesh of my flesh? It's too messy to love Eric Dolphy as his head splits open on the operating table and Uncle Charles falls out with the critics for pimping like his bitches begged him to sell me, no me, scooting hints, leaning into finitude for strings or soul dance. <laughs> Should we tell them to mute? Okay. So taking care of it. Okay. Um, lost my spot. Leaning into finitude for string, soul dance, and he was so great at it. He wept for the lady while slanging her. It was a dream, as in something you wake up from muttering, girl, you look pretty, can you sing? Let's never get free, I love you, fuck you. Are we recording because the exasperated beauty of Pharaoh's sound is really none of your business. On this raft with a blunt in the eye of the hurricane, it's really none of your business. Keeping on another dramatically brocaded velvet smoking jacket, yanking the shoulder pads out with your teeth, kiss me, make the sound you make on the brass in my mouth, crawl into the song when you leave and don't say which one, it's none of my business, but I'll be seeing you. And that soft stunt of a roundness curved and bound, imbricated, make it look like skin, aspirin, thin, whimper, no more sinners here, and a new force in the modern world. 
lucky no loss as you have to stumble into their ways and get ambushed. Black music is a music of forensics. All my dead friends come to me as songs so that I travel to the center of myself and dig the last pain out with the shadow of their ghosting screams. How wickedly quaint of the dream to exist as a heap of sounds only love can unlock. But at the time of the massacre, no one could count the dead with any accuracy. We had to count their gestures, neon letters flickering like bad eyes, ripped chattel of strategic music dimming to slow the mouth around the idea of word or name, freight of wounds, moody groomers. We used to call her the sweetheart, but she's still the sweetheart of the blues. Why can't they go back, stop the massacre before it starts befuddled having at having features, things to eat and futures, things to cross over and fathers, I told you, I don't trust father figures, distressed assets, why the gods are falling and so full of rot, it energizes them, rekindling our love of empire. Or everyone weird enough to be a savior will be taken to the market and sold with the sugar and gear. When you look at it this way, isolation is worthless and black song a straight jacket, we all wanna ride on behalf of daddy, is this genocide? And if the song just stops in the belly of me and you are reborn, am I just retrieving my own hunger for violent revenge and sound? The new moaners take a higher approach. Their cries don't grind, they leverage, push clouds around soft food, geomantic as if survival is intrusive. Nobody screams, everybody's dead and I head for the South and yesterday while well, the cis in the language pretend to be drums. Should I stop there or should I read something new? Read something new. Sweet. Um, yeah. Some poems in the new Harper's of November. And they're from a book, a new book I'm working on. Tentatively called Grift slash Grief, um, based on my theory that there's a lot of grifting happening in society. Uh, and also just the idea of like the absence of grieving and what that does. So this is called Grief Disarmament. You're a terrible witness, wore stage outfits to testimony, and upon returning home in search of his remains, you were really hunting down his flesh of guns. There was a suitcase full of firearms in the closet to the right of the front entrance, part of my inheritance, it's gone missing. Only the love songs remain stacked there in a melting spiral, hoping to be imbibed as guns have gone missing. They've become a nomadic violence as limber as fire itself when not confined to the mechanical or not registered to my long deceased father who was alive somewhere as a set of machines he collected for protection and leverage. A substitute for literacy made a killing protecting me, kept them manicured and close like comfort animals. Can they be traced now? Were they confiscated by the police after his arrest or sold at auction or held on to like mementos of his lost soul? Did his brother's mother, sister, cousins get any? Did they for one moment consider that his daughter might return, not in search of a body or ashes or his gravesite or soul fragments, but demanding his weapons and instruments, a Yamaha keyboard and a 45, a stack of tapes, a box of bullets, the cloudy amber, prescription pill tubes on his nightstand, barbiturates and high-pitched minerals, stale lithium, the timbre of shrill grocer roses, might as well imagine the chandeliered ceiling and him shooting the bulbs down as target practice. Orange shag carpet covered in glass shards like the undrawn eyes of a would-be muse shot down while high on sleeplessness, speechless mercurial as light itself, itself. But he was never that reckless. The suitcase of guns he kept in the coat closet was locked yellow with silver trim and the glint of a childhood raincoat, each rifle coiled inside in a fetal serenity waiting to be needed in the way an embryo awaits its turn to unfold. My heart awaits the impossible verdict where they sold to white men who perched them against trees like candy canes at Christmas, reducing my father's intensity to sport. Or is one waiting for me behind the trapdoor of a future amnesia as my love of the kind of intimacy that expires is rage. I've outgrown that too. The most violent act of my life has been recovery. Now I must reclaim this rudimentary feeling of losing track of an object that never belonged to me, the material scapegoat for a psychic void, and I will take possession of it so that it releases me how a trembling finger lifts from the trigger of an unloaded scheme. His guns are missing, and I yearn for their stunted butter-toned crib, which I could carry around like a briefcase full of his unlived dreams or swerve above my head like an erratic kite pretending our day at the beach together, bluffing 
until the sky turns fuchsia and embarrassment, severing my tie with my weapons danger. So they come out of me as ornament and beauty and everybody I once knew is strange and gagged in the closet, a suspect gone. I can keep going or stop there um, for time. Why don't you read just a little bit more? Okay. Just, That's yeah. Cool. I'll just, I'll read the series in Harper's and then I'll stop there. There's three, two or the next two are short. So this is That's great. Graft. The drama can impersonate pain. Real pain is uneventful. The process of discovering something that was always there, refusing attention like a monster inside, waiting to become you if you don't catch it first and trade places or false modesty, modesty switching to dejection when no one corrects it. He used to make the white boys lick his boots at the concert hall before performances. Then he'd borrow their instruments so they couldn't play them anyways, like an officer disarms his suspects by exploiting their bravado. This it was his subverted, sub, subservience taking revenge on itself. His monster saying yes, his way of grieving the funk of their praise before it could tackle and change him. Nothing's quite as sad as trading tongues in the club that way, fake laughter of the bystanders hurling at us like a whip. And this is called grift. Perhaps a corruption of graft ever after, dishonest toil or broken work. What ifs that inspire you to switch direction mid deliberation or lament, I can hear the grift machine gearing up again while clapping for it on cue. Also the orbit of a broken verse, like the half clap and that Dilla sampled from heart to skin surface and sip and unmapped, unbaptized three fifths and gifted with favor in a swarm. Oppressive favor skin first, or when we went to the circus and they yelled act your age, not your color, lift every voice here. Make a chorus of breaks, miscreants, misrememberers embroiled in fluke and fantasy took apart by their own charade and pretty soon this hallucination sponsorship will come through. Like hitmen called to duty, but bulky with luck, fire on the screen does not burn the screen. Your skin stares back at your ending unfazed, unchanged, hoping the skit resolves before it smudges a notion of real life burning or teaches passion to behave like luck. A quandary for the vicious theorists who mistake concepts for deeds or fates all day and when dusk, and when dusk arrives, pray to the flickering gasp of fake fire scentless mute embers of my silhouette, which he calls human girl, until my disillusionment and afterwards monster pusher shows me a mirror with his reflection in it and says we made a movie, that it was romantic, that I was ticklish and blushing when I had been squirming, unyielding all the way through Buffalo with the nauseous fumes of Chevy leather swollen on my blackened eyelids, so purple, trying not to fall asleep in the crime stream right at the part where he declares his innocence and, my, and I parody mine for Alms twirling, wishing to become the fix of glass that shatters in the back of his mind when I scream. Cool. I'll stop there. Thank you, Harmony. Yeah, thank you, Harmony. Yeah, you all are welcome to unmute and applaud <laughs> whenever a reader comes. Thanks um, so much, Harmony. Yeah, thanks, Harmony. It was uh, harrowing and beautiful. Um, I will introduce our next performer, who is a beloved member of the Fence Board of Directors. And uh, from basically from scratch, built the Fence website and watches over it. Um, Menachem Kaiser is the author of Plunder, a memoir of family property and not treasure, which was a New York Times critic best nonfiction book of 2021 and winner of the Canadian Jewish Literary Award for Biography. Um, this is an, uh, an incredible book that starts out as a kind of uh, straightforward investigation into stolen property uh, stolen by the Nazis uh, from Menachem's family and then turns into a much wilder, unexpected ride. So I hand it over to Menachem. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jason, just nod if you could hear me. OK, great. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I just want to give a real hearty shout out uh, to Emily and Jason 
like being behind the scenes, like just, I, you guys think a lot of work goes in, it's ex exponentially more what you guys don't see. And there's just a tremendous amount of back and forth and sweat and heartache and time um, that went into not only organizing this event and the auction, but all that stuff like requires just a huge amount um, of investment. And so uh, I just really just wanna congratulate you guys um, for closing out the ceremony and for all the work that's been done. Um, you know, I'm right now, I'm actually in Montreal. I'm reporting a story. And, uh, you know, after I finished my book, I really thought I could get away from working in a language I didn't understand. And it turns out um, that hasn't happened. And now, once again, I'm trying, I, I don't speak French, even though I'm from Canada, and I'm struggling to sort of report a story that is like 25% in French. And so actually what I, it reminded me uh, of a short story I wrote um, a long time ago in graduate school that recently got published in the European Review of Books. And so I just wanted to read a short excerpt about that, which deals with translation. All you need to know up until this point is that the, the protagonist is, is a writer. Uh, he wrote a story that got translated into Lithuanian, which he doesn't speak. And then all of a sudden through, you know, for the next few weeks, sort of there's like little hints here and there that the translation might not be what he thinks it is. So he comes home. I went home and paced my room and scratched my cheek, which is what I do when I'm really anxious. And after an hour and a half of pacing and scratching, I looked up a professional translation company. I called them and explained at length and in a manner I thought very clear what I required, that all I needed was a plot summary, not a word for word translation. But all they offered was public publication quality translation and the cost calculated per word was outrageous. So what I would do, I decided, is type my own story, type carefully these blocks of strangely voweled characters into an online translator. It wouldn't be a great translation, but it would be, for my purposes, totally fine. Feeling very calm and purposeful, I sat in front of my computer, my copy of Snarglies, that's the name of the journal, open on my lap, and I got to it. I typed out my entire story. This took an exceptionally long time. Every word was a nightmare to spell. But as I typed, it felt like I was actually writing. I achieved a sort of communion with the words. Maybe not exactly authorship, but also not not authorship. In fact, it felt like particularly inspired writing, something close to pure inspiration, all unfiltered, unmediated. I didn't understand what I was writing. I was just writing. This communion was interrupted only when I came to a word I recognized. And there was only one word I recognized, which was jidu and variations thereof, and it showed up roughly once a paragraph, and each time it shattered my fuzzy illusion. And panic would flood in, and I'd remember why I was doing this, why I was transcribing character by character in the first place. It took six, seven hours, which I did straight and with nearly unwavering attention. This was easily the most successful writing session I'd ever had, and then copied and pasted into an online translator. I clicked, and there appeared a rough translation of Augie's, who's the original translator, of my story. Now, given the well below idiomatic quality of the translation of Augie's translation, it wasn't always easy to follow. And there were a number of passages I was extremely confused about, but as best as I can tell, my story now followed a young man who lives in a big American city and who is Jewish, but ambivalently so, or as the story puts it, I am a Jew, of course, but in fact, that means am. The eye color, hair curliness of simplest genetics, like more than anything else should be involved. How quickly I can run? The protagonist attends what seems to be a fancy party. There he is cornered by an older man who's also Jewish, but far more conspicuously and consciously Jewish than the protagonist is. And they have a conversation that is seemingly extremely theologically charged. At one point, the conspicuous Jew says, God, the Jews, God is not your pants. God does not care about your penis pants or put you put on it. God cares about you, he cares about solution is everything. The protagonist, alienated and annoyed, could be I'm projecting, but this was the motivation that seemed to make the most sense, leaves the party and goes to another party. I am unsure why he didn't just go home. It could be he doesn't know why either. He's looking for something, that much is clear. There is a distinct sense of searching. He leaves the next party too, goes to a third party. At each party, he has an uncomfortable conversation regarding Jew slash Judaism, then leaves. He does this the entire night, each party a little fancier, more exclusive than the last. From penthouse to loft, to club to apartment to loft, each party pointing to the next like a kind of scavenger hunt. Eventually he reaches the top. He arrives at what appears to be the most exclusive party in the history of the city. This party is happening in a loft the size and shape of a warehouse. 
even in jumbled English, it's an eerie scene. There's no music, no one is talking. It's totally silent. Everyone is just standing around solemnly watching each other. The protagonist wanders the enormous room. In a far dark corner, he comes upon a ladder hidden inside a rolled up purple velvet curtain. He climbs the ladder. He climbs up inside this thick velvet cylinder. He climbs and climbs way past where the ceiling should have been. Soon he can't see down. All he sees is a circle of purple dark below. Circle of purple dark, that's my description, by the way. That wasn't in the translation of the translation. After an impossibly long time, he gets to the top where there is a wooden trap door. The trap door is very old. The wood is warped and there are cracks and mildewy stains. The protagonist, always a good sport, pushes up and goes through the trap door. There's a paragraph break and the protagonist is suddenly in a cellar. Low ceiling, uneven wooden floor, etc. All in all, very cellar-like, dank, dark, dirty, you know. A single candle throws shadows onto the stone brick walls, and it becomes apparent that the protagonist isn't alone. There is with him inside the cellar a young girl. As far as I can determine, she is very pretty. She is afraid, shaken, but what she's afraid of and shook up by is not the protagonist's sudden appearance, but these stomps overhead, which the protagonist seems to take quite a long time to notice, but whatever, of what sounds like booted men stomping around upstairs. The protagonist asks the girl who she is, what these stomps are, why is she in this basement, why is he in this basement, but she doesn't understand the questions. She doesn't speak his language. She just takes her head and motions for him to be quiet. The protagonist, apparently finally ready to call it a night, tries to leave, to go back down the ladder, but the trap door will not open. No matter how hard he pulls, it won't budge. He's stuck. So he waits with this girl until the clomping retreats, and when it's finally quiet, when it's finally safe, the two of them exhale and look at each other. They are holding hands. It's a warm-hearted but also uncomfortable scene. The energy between them is distinctly sexual. And indeed, things start heating up kissing, touching, disrobing. At this point though, the story got very unclear. It was impossible to tell if my incomprehension was due to the poor quality of the translation, so the computer's fault, or the Lithuanian text itself, Augie's fault, or, or my fault. Here's what I did figure out. The protagonist and the girl seem to have sex. The shadows of their entangled bodies on the wall are lovingly reported. However, it also becomes clear that the protagonist has traveled in time and that this girl is in fact the protagonist's grandmother. Let me emphasize that it's not clear at what point, which is to say before, during, or after the maybe sex, this fact becomes clear. In fact, it's not even clear if the protagonist is aware that he's related to this young girl, or if it's only the reader who's let in. But to reiterate, regardless of what the protagonist believed, whether he knew or did not know the real identity of this girl, she definitely is his grandmother, and they definitely have maybe sex. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna stop there and then i was yeah i'm i'm all about short you know shorter readings are we uh or i, I could fill time if necessary but uh I'm, I'm happy to turn it back over to you guys now okay um I believe our next well actually our next performer will be here at nine <laughs> so um, we could either have like a surprise volunteer from the audience. Oh, that's read. cool. Um, why don't we Why don't we do that? Um, why don't we Why don't we choose it? Why don't we? Uh, it'll be a non-volunteer. We just right. choose someone. They have to do it. All right. <laughs> uh, I can choose uh, Michael Chang, who is a new uh, poetry editor, and um, is like the most prolific poet I've ever known, has multiple books and is only 16. So, um, Michael, if you want. Thank you, Menachem. Let's give an applause Thanks, for Menachem. Menachem. Yeah, that was gorgeous. Yeah, thank you. And again, once more, just a huge, uh, you know, a huge bit of gratitude to uh, Emily and Jason for putting this all together. Thanks, Menachem. All right. Let me see. All right, if Michael's not going to step forward, we're going to have to have somebody else. So, um, what about see. Rebecca? Yeah, what about Rebecca? Rebecca has a brand new book out. <laughs> I want to hear the new book. Yeah, Rebecca, could you read a little bit? <laughs> and she's our progenitor. Yes. Hi, hi everybody. Um, 
Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Hi Rebecca. Um, I could read a poem. I have to go grab it, though. OK. OK. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Struggling. We'll, we'll talk about you while you're gone. Um, I mean, from I know yeah, yesterday was publication day for Slight Return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from Wave Books. And, and there's a hardcover coming out in November. I tried to get the hardcover. It's not, um, it's a limited. Wave folks let me know it's November. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's limited edition. Yeah. It's small. Um, okay, so uh, I'll just read the title poem because I think it's almost mine, right? Um, yeah. It's kind of, kind of doer, um, but it's a slight return. I'm living backwards, I'm so delayed, but I have been given the opportunity to begin again, to start over moving forward bereft, stripped bare, bereaved. The old personality wasn't working and nothing meant anything anymore. The old meaning apparatus did not produce meaning anymore. I've been given an opportunity to start over. Sound familiar? How can a person be? I'm going to have to look for something else to give my life meaning, to give meaning to my life. As for continuing, one must, or is it possible to decide to continue no matter what, vessel? And then you just do the every day, every day thing. It is a good thing there is so much time in the day each day hours for each trespass, hallowed and valorized, vaporized. <laughs> I, I, in this copy of my book, which I just got, um, I don't know if you can actually see this, but like the page has this extra little flap on it just because they cut the book mm. off or something at the printer. <gasps> I think it's possibly only in my one copy of this, but anyway, so it's very special to me. So thank you for letting me read that poem. Do you need me to like read one more poem for three minutes until the next reader gets here? One more poem would be awesome. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, uh, I'm trying to find one that's not really super down or, um, I'll read this for Menachem. Are you still here, Menachem? Yeah. Yes. Um, yep, definitely. Okay. Yeah, this one, I actually uh, wrote it in Lithuania, where uh, I first met Menachem. And it's called The Singing Revolution. Um, there's a memorial outside of Vilnius, the, the main city of Lithuania, um, for, you know, it's a memorial uh, to uh, like a detainment camp where Jews were um, placed during uh, the, the Holocaust and were exterminated. Um, you may approach, approach that stone. You may sit here, see here, see from here. How can I sing about not that optimal distance, but about. Would that in a wood be desirable? Rhyme or reason? Everyone has a reason. Systematic evil in the past. Tune of reason equals removed from empathic, of course, because reason is a closed system within a pit. Or is it opposite? Reason must be ratified by consensus. Reason is bounded psychologically or reason is unbound on a scale of realism. Reason 
a vector that marches fearlessly out, and rhyme a bubble bounded ephemera. No, yes, it is rhyme that allows empathic coalition. Meanwhile, the guide in effective English describes exertions in the pit and the manner in which the columns filed collapsed into the trenches of the pit describes, describes, not only to the pit, but in trenches that is described in notes in bottles buried in the garden. Semantic genocide, I don't know how many, how many does it take? Dramatic irony guide tells how meticulous note taker was shot for bicycle one week in advance of liberation. Backward glance at the evil in the past. Backward glance at scale of massive human pit through the tall, tall trees. Oof, another pit. And we pushed the guide into the pit. Sorry, that was a bummer too. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you for that pop-up opportunity. <laughs> Pop up. Uh, and I see Janice Lowe is here. Uh, welcome, Janice. Is there a an echo in my voice? Oh, no. uh, that would be from someone else's mic being on and your voice going in through their mic. Oh, right. Um, so if everyone could mute, that would be great. I think it's Cynthia is not muted. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just clicking mute all from my end. And here we go. Cynthia is muted. It's all good. Yes. Um, hello, Janice. Uh, so performing with Janice Lowe uh, will be Howard Alper on percussion and Johan Portico on bass guitar. Uh, Janice recently made a fall raw salad um, called arugula apple slivered raw zucchini salad with raw sunflower seeds, raisins, a dash of coconut flakes, Dijon, a squeeze of lime, and a smidgen of olive oil, which I look forward to trying. Uh, Janice also recommends the books Liner Notes for the Revolution by Daphne A. Brooks and A Brief History of Burning by Kate O'Kane. Uh, and also We Free Strings by Melanie Dyer from the album Love in the Form of Sacred Outrage. I love that title. And the short films, Angola, Do You Hear Us? Voices from a Plantation Prison, directed by Sink Northern. And As Far As They Can Run, directed by Tanaz Ishagian. Uh, and I recommend her book of poems, Leaving Klee, Poems of Nomadic Dispersal. And uh, the Miami University Press did this book. Uh, so we're ready for you all. And I'm going to start with uh, a piece Sweet Black Friar, uh, which is inspired by uh, Amelia Baraka's novel, The Six in the Oh, Janice, we're, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Can you hear me better now? Still? Yeah. Is it still low? It's still pretty low. Okay. How's this better? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we're going to start with um, a piece I composed the, uh, called Sweet Black Friar inspired by Amelia Baraka's novel, The System of Dante's Hell. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
think how would Alfred drum? that in all of my bones dang yeah, yeah. um yeah janice thank that you, was janice. yeah thank, thank you, you howard so thank you johan yes janet howard and johan that was hot and holy shit thank you um wow so let's just pause for a moment let the sound ripple in our bodies for a bit mm. and then um i will introduce the next person who will be performing which is angel dominguez and let's see uh, Angel, basically the next, the, Angel and Adam Kinner, who's performing after our um, two writers, I had the grand fortune of finding in the Fence submissions and um, being able to publish their incredible writing, like both pieces I remember at the moment I started reading uh, each piece and um, Angel has gone on to publish several books and uh, since uh, since then and uh, the name of so Angel was published in the in Fence in the fall oh I was like the other editor and I've been so uh, uh, with Sarah Faulkner for the past few years. And 
each time I get to go in this got got to go in the submissions was like being parachuted into rainforest or uh, scuba diving in a coral reef. It was it's just such an honor to be able to read people's writing and then to like wait for the moment when one piece just like slaps you across the face. And uh, just like the very beginning of Angel Dominguez's piece that we published, um, it's called Somnambulisms to Zonat Shard for, correct me if I'm wrong, Angel, uh, I think it's Zix, it's X-I-X. -X. Um, pronounced sheesh. It's a, sheesh. it's a Yucatec That's Mayan right. word, yeah. <laughs> Perfect, okay, all right. I will finish and then it will, uh, just a moment. Um, but th these are your words, so it really should be in your voice. So what I would say is people should, uh, if you are a subscriber to Fence, all you need to do is uh, email myself or Emily or fence, fencebooks at gmail.com to request a code to access your digital subscription, which includes the entire Fence archive. And you can also buy a digital subscription on its own on our subscription page. Um, and I mean, so that was, so Angel's piece I, I read in 2016 and I still like really bodily remember the experience of it. Um, and uh, let me tell you a little bit more. Um, so in terms of uh, some of some things about Angel, um, he is he's recently read uh, and recommends City of the Future by Seshi Foster, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy by Jenny O'Dell, which is a book I've been meaning to read, um, and ooh, Acrylica by Juan Felipe Herrera. Um, some of Angel's favorite things, tending to and gazing upon the galaxy petunias in the garden I, he built, spending time listening to records with his partner and their little cat, Luna, um, the Blue Note Records Tone Poet Series, hikes in the redwoods or coastal bluffs. He says his favorite food would be tacos and that all tacos are healing. And some enthusiasms are forever poetry, the gentle autumn mist of the microclimate where they live and staying alive. So Angel, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, it's a real honor to be here, gathered in such a powerful constellation of writing and energy. And um, Fence has always loomed very large in my mind and my heart. And I remember getting that email from Jason and feeling like, oh, they fucked up. They totally fucked up. They didn't mean to uh, pick this out of the pile. And um, and it's been a somnambulism ever since, right? Just walking through this dream of a life that um, involves poetry, involves poets. Um, and so it is a dream to, to be here to read some stuff for y'all. Um, and I thought I would read the poem uh, that is also a broadside that you can bid on right now at the link. Um, I don't know if the link is actually in the chat. I'm sorry for giving you false information if that is not the case. Um, but the poem is called Hope Beyond the Shape of a Century um, and comes from an as of yet unpublished manuscript called Don't Tell My Mother If They Kill Me. Uh, it is a part of the Latinx, Chicanx, Poetics uh, broadside series with Moving Parts Press um, and was handset uh, in Garamond type and printed on Zirkel Frankfurt cream paper in an edition of 60 by uh, the poet and artist Hannah Kazima and Felicia Rice um, at the Moving Parts Press location, which sadly um, burned down during the CZU uh, fires. So I'm going to read this poem, which you can have on your bathroom wall, 
any wall in your home, bring it with you every day, fold it up. Hope beyond the shape of a century. Sometimes you build a city block within your body. You name it decade and you drown it with forgetting. Sometimes you build a time zone in your organs. You say, sleep, 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 in phases like the moon. This country says, drink this cup and it'll always be full. They don't mention that it's poison. You don't mention your thirst, the salt in the water, the weather continues. This country wakes you up with shapes of genocide and war. The country rides taking selfies against a pile of corpses. Everyone so soft at funerals. Um, so there, that's the broadside. Um, and I thought I would read, <clears throat> I would read some letters from my new book out through Nightboat, uh, Desgraciado, The Collected Letters. My background is the cover collage that um, I created for the book. Um, here's me and uh, Diego de Landa fighting forever on the floor of the cosmos. Um, <laughs> there are other secrets about this image, but I'm going to leave those to other times. So um, I have this thing when I read where I always have like a vague idea of what I would like to read, you know, but more than anything, sometimes I feel like you just need to let the book drive. Um, so I'm going to let the book drive for a couple of letters. Dear Diego, tell me what you know of stars. Tell me what you know of living. Tell me what you believe in your heart to be the truth. Do you still think about us when you're lonely? Do you know what it means to be lonely in every language you speak? Do you know what it means to be lonely in tongues that have vanished or been burned away before you could speak? Do you know how many conquistadors it takes to ruin my day? Do you know how many Bibles I've owned and lost and kept and thrown out? Do you know how many churches and citadels I've wept and pissed in? Do you know how many I've seen baptized? Do you know how many prayers I speak? Do you know what it is you've done to me? Tell me what you know of departure. Tell me what you know of ruin. Tell me what you really mean. Do you know how many times have passed since your time? Do you know how many colonizers it takes to ruin my day? Do you know how many have died? Do you know how to get to heaven? Do you know the road to El Dorado? Do you have any change? Do you even have a chance? Do you speak American? Do you hide your heart like a reef? Do you dream of many dreams? Do you recognize the pain in my childhood screams? Do you want to be the parent? Do you want to hold these shuddering shoulders until the earthquake hits? Do you know how to save a life? Do you know how to write? Do you know what time it is? Do you know how to come back home? Do you know what this is anymore? Tell me the truth. Tell me everything about you. Tell me why you did it. Tell me why you didn't. Tell me everything. Do you remember? Do you think about the downfall? Do you think about the darkness? Do you think about the blood? Do you think about the sun? Do you think about the ripples across reality? Do you think about the way out? Do you think about my eyes? Do you think about the sky? Do you think about the violence? Do you think about the heat? Do you think about the boat? Do you think about the screams? Do you think about the lies? Do you think about the water? Do you? dream about me? Do you even care? Do you want to make it better? Do you want to make it out alive? Do you want to be alive? Do you care if I die? Do you care if we all die? Do you? Tell me what you know about the end. Tell me what you know about oblivion. Tell me what you know about the truth beyond you. Tell me what you know of moons. Tell me you love me, please. Diego, I only dream of learning to pronounce myself clearly. Um, we'll see what else the book wants. And please do let me know if I start to move out of time. I couldn't relate more to that feeling that Harmony mentioned earlier. Of when you're reading the poems, could have been an hour, could have been two minutes. Um, it's really unclear sometimes. Dear Diego, keep your hands up. 
I never know if we're fighting or about to fuck. Sweat on sweat, tooth to flesh. We keep circling on each other like twin sharks in a mermaid purse. Sometimes I think that I am a haunted house on the brink of collapse and you are the lonesome ghost that won't let me. I think about how growing up, I would get so angry that I would burst into tears. My anger would wash out into an overwhelming sadness, a deep depression and the disappointment of it all. I never wanted to win. And yet that's what this whole house of glass is predicated upon, haves and have nots. And nothing is more dehumanizing than money all of it imaginary, triggered by the onslaught of the sun, there is nowhere to run when the entire planet is warming. So how big a compost bin must I dig to fit the Department of Defense in it? How deep must I dig to bury the three Ks that hold up this nation nightmare? How many times do I need to die to get out from under the fallacy of white supremacy? Who am I even fighting anymore? I'm afraid to use words like us because I honestly don't know what that means anymore. Always feels like I'm fighting, feeling the fists of my great, great grandfather in a Yucatan ring, moving like a hurricane, folding fools like blades of grass underfoot. Feels like I am always on the floor of my consciousness, blood in my eyes, trying to rally a comeback, constantly punching at the foundations of my own family to get to the root of everything. And a fist cannot dig as well as an open hand. And so I go searching for water in the soil of my heart, trying to tour guide myself back to my base origins, always afraid of what I'll find. Worry always on my mind. It stresses me out to think about how to best pronounce myself, always wondering what the words might be to best see myself clearly. Sometimes I think eventually I'll find your tongue, Diego golden, riddled with roaches and diamonds, and buried in one of these three billion spiral staircases that make a map of my genome. And when I finally figure you out, when I finally find you, Diego, I will never, ever let you go. Hmm. And I might read one more, and then I thought it might be fun to read something new, um, if there is time. Yeah, sure. Great. I I actually just emailed you. Um, I went in the the digital archive and like just copied like the first paragraph of of the piece that was in fence long ago, and uh, but I'm gonna if one thing that would be great is if everyone in the I don't want to take you off of your track. So if um, you'd like me to, um, if you'd like a little sampler of writing of the readers, uh, just put your email in the chat and we will collect them and uh, send you a little uh, reminder of what you heard tonight. But Angel, please keep going. Yeah, I... You know, I meant to pull that piece up, um, and then I just didn't get my shit together in time. So no, no, don't here worry we are. About <laughs> um, so here's yeah, one last letter. Five more minutes, Angel. Great. So here's one last letter from uh, Desgraciado. Dear Diego, my mouth sprouts mimosa flowers, and I begin vomiting acres of rain. I get so sick when I enter language without my body. All my talismans of self crumble under the weight of whiteness, which demands acquiescence. The colonizers require you to colonize too and be colonized over and over and over again until you forget how to pronounce your name. When I try to pronounce my name, my mouth pours volcanoes of acid rain, transforming these oppressive monuments and mush mouths into earthen materials again. I vomit pyrocumulus clouds across the continent in search of my name, waging migraine aura against reality, trying to be free of this Western way of seeing every doctor I've seen tells me that I don't actually understand my pain. Ibuprofen again, copay again, 
We don't want you endangering the community with a sense of liberation. Who knows what you would do with actual relief? You might learn to be free of the constant pain. You might demand to be free of all suffering. You might put two and two together and realize the colonies and your pain are for nothing more than the expansion of misery so that the ruling class can hop on a rocket while they wither our planet into oblivion. You might figure out how to pronounce yourself clearly. We need you to say debt. Debt, 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 debt. We need you to say this so that billionaires can unbuckle their seatbelts in space for four minutes of weightlessness. It's just like Gil Scott Heron said, I can't pay no doctor bill, but Whitey's on the moon. A pile of unsent letters. Um, and I'll just finish with uh, what is the, the start of the final book of the Elixir trilogy, as I've secretly called it for I don't know how long. Um, but it's Black Lavender Milk, Rose Sun Water, and the last book is called Obsidian Mirror Wine. The sea has been calling out to me in dreams. Having never dreamt of the sea, it's been something surreal to have made itself known to me in dreams, the vast immensity of it all, the way my dreams have been telling me new things, asking more of me illuminating more of me, all by way of sea. It was the first sea dream that brought me down a path that eventually led to this almost subterranean area of beach surrounded by smooth sandstone walls covering all but an archway. It framed the mighty sea in a golden hour eternity. There were large anemone fossil slabs visible beyond the soft mound of sand where the archway ended and the sea began. I think I followed my inner child down the pathway, arriving at this sandstone portal. My father was there, eyes emulating Droopy the cartoon dog. He rested his head against the sandstone walls, unable to look beyond the archway. I hated that he was there for this first dream of the sea, and yet here he was. There he seems to be in various dreams I can't quite make sense of. Some weeks later, I would actually dream of the house where we lived in that we would go on, that would go on to be foreclosed upon. There is a lot to say about that house and I never really even thought about it until now and I'm not prepared to talk about it. What I will say is I've never dreamed of that house, but there was that house, it was still ours, yet we were all older or rather my siblings and myself were all the age we are now, and my sister had climbed a ladder to leave an electronic tablet facing the sky. She said it was so Tata could see, and I somehow was able to see the slideshow of photos from various family moments before I climbed up to see the tablet shining in the sun. And I think this might have been my first time dreaming of my sister. It was also the first time I dreamt of my grandfather, Tata. Though he was not physically in the dream, his spirit was ever present. Perhaps that's why I dreamt of that house, which was something he worked on with my father a lot. Thinking back now, I can see that he was determined to help my father figure out a way to make that house his in the way that my grandfather had cultivated the house in Culver City. Both houses were foreclosed upon. Thank you, everybody. Great, thank you, Angel. Thank you, Angel. Okay. Um, I think, let me check something. Uh, where is he? Okay. Um, I just got a, a text from, the person who I mentioned before, uh, who has a P, who has a a poetry consultation uh, up for bid, who is um, one of our amazing poetry editors, Michael Chang, who's I think going to drop in and just read uh, share one poem. Hi. 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 Hi, Hi. Michael. Hi, Emily. Hi, thanks. Um, this is my book that came out in September, um, but I have another one coming out in March and I'll put the link in the chat. But 
Lit Hub did a, um, a cover reveal today, so it's really cute. Um, I'll just read one because I know, you know, we're pressed for time, but really happy to be here. And Emily and Jason did such a great job with this whole um, thing from start to finish. So we're really um, grateful and happy. Um, so this is called Rose and Queer. Actually, I don't mind. I don't think I'd mind you knowing my sweat and sperm like obscure lyrics committed to memory or a cascading fountain after the fall of Gaddafi. I realize it's customary to say I'm giving in tonight, but sleep, I'm not the surrendering kind. Take me evening with honeyed limbs. I like how you sometimes come apart, neither cheap nor a thrill, sort of unhinged, everything sluggish, complications, a consensus choice. Suppose we ignore things that aren't me, roll our eyes at grief and prizes for poets over 40. I read these poems and think you will fuck these poets. Fuck the shit out of them. Yes, we know the truth. Just do it. Fuck their buck teeth straight. Liz Claiborne headbands all bent out of shape. Dispose of them and remind them you're a fuck boy, your master cock hopping a chain link fence, leaving them alone with their garbage snoozer poems shivering colors and small towns in italics. Come back to me, give me your stomach, press into me, allow me one small happiness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael, that was yeah. excellent. Do you wanna, uh, Michael, come back for a second. Do you wanna just uh, say what your auction mm -hmm. offering is? Oh yeah, so I'm gonna do, um, uh, I'm gonna take you out for dinner and tell you about your poems or like look through your manuscript and it'll be really nice. And um, I've done this before for a few other places and it's always been really fun. Um, so yeah, so we'll just do that, go bid. Um, congrats on the rest of the auction and we're really excited. Um, I know I saw um, there's wine at Emily's house or something. So that I thought that was really cute. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. All right. And up next um, is Adam Kinner, who is like Menachem in Montreal, coincidentally. And, but is that is where Adam resides, which I'm quite envious of. Um, so Adam is a musician, an artist, and a writer. He was born in Washington, D.C. and is in Montreal. Recently, he read A Month in Siena by Hisham Matar and loved its economical prose. He is a student of improvisation, intuition, and conceptual art. He often gushes about Renee Gladman and Gail Scott and has read Lisa Robertson's Baudelaire Fractal more times than he wishes to admit. These days, he is learning to make clothing and is writing about music. His writing has been published in Fence, the Capiano Review, academic journals Turba and Segal, and elsewhere. And uh, the piece Michael, uh, not Michael, that we just saw Michael, uh, the piece that Adam, Adam published in Fence was from the the winter 2022 issue and i just uh was so struck by the first sentence or the and like the the first uh four or five sentences that i immediately know i immediately knew it was we were going to publish it so I, i'll just read you those five sentences uh let's see each day when he wakes up he wants to fill the bedroom with a tone he imagines the tone before he gets out of bed, a tone that feels full, that resonates his small body, that seems to get, to gain intensity from its surroundings, a tone that seems endless. And Adam, I turn it over to you. Hello, can y'all hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, it's always funny to be on these Zooms. Um, 
I guess I was thinking maybe I would read a little bit and then play saxophone. How does that sound to everybody? What's what's the mood in the room? Yeah, let's hear some saxophone. Saxophone? Okay. Poems and saxophone. Just saxophone. No, some a little both. Some of both. Both, uh, yes, both. <laughs> That's what I meant. Both. <laughs> All right. Well, um, everyone says both. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um, so I guess, yeah, first I'll just say thanks to everybody for, for having me, for coming to this event. For I mean, I think Fence is such a special um, place and thing and regularly occurring event. And uh, I just, I, I think it's, yeah, it's done a lot for me in terms of, of reading it and 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 I really appreciate also Jason's uh, lovely uh, grabbing of me out of the pile. Um, this so I, I've been writing about the tone, and I I'm still writing about the tone. It's been years. It's something I can't leave. So I thought I'd just read a little bit of a more recent um, foray into the tone, um, and then I'll play some saxophone. And just to say that I guess. Um, in case it's not clear, it's real, like the way I write this is that I pl play saxophone and and I try to find the tone. I, I don't know how else to say it. So, so I'll just read a little bit and then I'll, I'll play some tone. And let me know if I'm ever over the time that I'm allotted. So this is, yeah, the continuation of the series. Each day when he wakes up, he wants to fill the bedroom with a tone. Today, the tone arrives as a series of notes in a particular order. A, B flat, E, and C. He puts them there in the bedroom and looks at them. He can't describe why these notes have a particular quality today, but it's undeniable that they do. Each one is tender and fragile. They bend with the weight of the world. To play them is to feel what it feels to follow this feeling into the world and back into the note. He is engaged in this work for some time, following a note to the end of it and seeing, it where, seeing where it takes him. The work itself has an endless quality. He keeps thinking he is done, but the work continues, so he must continue. To end the work early is to forsake the gift of the tone, which is to forsake the seeker and the act of seeking. He must push each note into the room and then he must stay with it until it ends. He must sit in the silence after and consider how the next note will change the work that the previous one did. And when the next note is through, he must leave it off so that it is possible to play the following one. Each note is the same and different. They have a space between them, but in fact, they are the same tone and the tone is the tone of the work. While the note is going, you have a moment to catch yourself. The world, real work is in understanding how the next note will start and what it will do to the whole series. The real work is in understanding how the next note will start and what it will do to the whole series. We call this work work, but also it is not work. It is rather a strange edifice emerging, unrelated to working. He sits there in silence and plays the notes in their order. He has heard people play the right notes, but not play the tone. Of course he has. He's heard it's the work's tone that makes the tone and the denial that it is work. The work that goes beyond the note into the way that the space is teaching you how to listen. Work is different than the notes. Work's me work means you have to do this even though no one is paying you. And no one will ever pay you for the tone even if they intend to. The tone, is not, the tone will not circulate as a commodity. Work means that you have to sit with the tone's non-appearance even when it doesn't seem that the conditions are favorable for any tone at all. Work means that you have to go through the not thisness of the tone and arrive at a place that might be the tone but you have no way of knowing. Work means that you have to listen to some people tell you about the tone <clears throat> and not in agreement even when you know that what they are saying is propaganda. People will tell you that work and mastery are the same thing but they are wrong. What they are saying is government propaganda. Mastery is a different thing. It suggests an ending. It's not work. Work wallows in its endlessness. It's when you study and study and still have to study. 
He realizes that he has been sitting in the silent room for some time after the notes ended. He is still working, bereft, working on hearing when the next note will come, if it does. I'll, just, I'll play a little saxophone. I, don't, I hope it sounds good. I don't, if it doesn't sound good, just turn it down or something. more what did i play a little more sure you could play it yeah a little bit more um that'd be, that'd be good there's uh, like one weird tone that that i can't tell if you're generating it or if it comes it's only one note and it's like it reverberates slightly and i can't tell if it's that exact frequency resonating with the computer and i don't know if other people are hearing it too but it's it's so it's I very, heard it very too. it's very intriguing and it's hard and i i couldn't tell whether it was uh, intentional or whether it was some something about that frequency with the the computer microphone do you do you know what i'm talking about yeah is it the one that sounds like this yeah that's yes. the one that's the that's one <laughs> that's just that's just a special saxophone trick oh, oh cool cool, cool. <laughs> i like okay. it well, the computer. I, I like it 
I, I was like, it's yeah, a nice cool. collaboration between you and the computer or it's your own brilliance. So uh, yeah, we've got a couple more minutes. So, so uh, go for it. Okay. Maybe the computer will play some notes too. <laughs> yeah, you've got five more minutes, Adam. Okay, I'll, I'll play another, uh, I don't know what exactly, but I'll try something. There's a person playing next door. I don't know if you can hear it, but just a little bit. Right at the end, it was like right at the <laughs> key. It was really strange. <laughs> I hope you couldn't hear it because it wasn't it wasn't part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. Next time we'll have like you and Janice's trio like perform simultaneously, mm -hmm. um, like collaboratively from Montreal to New York. Um, Great. Thank you so much, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's really nice. Uh, Emily, is uh, are, is Leanne here? Or yes, and I'm ready awesome. to introduce Leanne. Fantastic. Yes. So Leanne Brown makes biscuits in star heart number and dog shapes she tells me that as a kid she and her sister would get a thrill out of saying to guests would you like a dog biscuit her fence book in the laurels cot is one i return to often and here it is so there's some available at spd and we have some as well uh, and what I'm what I'm about to say, I feel this deep in my soul. I really feel and believe that her work at Tender Buttons Press as founder and publisher will be felt for many years to come, and those ripples will grow organically. It's just going to keep going. Um, 
And I really think this is a, a deep truth of that press uh, and also of Leanne's poetry. It's like outside of that short-lived short -lived fabricated publicity system that we're all apparently supposed to follow <laughs> and like it's a weird necessity in some ways but um but Leanne's work will just continue outside of that so here is Leanne thank you Emily that's really sweet of you thanks I just saw it Jason at the Modpo thing at the Morgan Library that we both ran to wherever we are and here we are again <laughs> in the third virtual space. Hello everybody. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit from my fence book, which is really one of my favorite books. And it's sort of a meditation and ethnography in a way, investigation of living in Appalachia. Um, I've got a cabin up in the mountains of North Carolina. And I grew up in the Piedmont down in Charlotte, but then I um, moved up to the mountains part-time and I still go there after 20 years of going there. But this book was written when I first um, was able to spend a lot of time there in my adult life. I mean, I went there when I was a kid, but um, this is called Black is the Color. And it's of course named after the Black is the Color of My True Love's Hair, which is a wonderful um, song that was collected in Madison County in the um, so it was sort of lost to time. And then it was collected um, by like Cecil Sharp. And uh, of course, Nina Simone did a great cover of it. But this is Black is the Color. And it's got an epigraph by Elvis Perkins. Yellow is the color of my true love's crossbow. Yellow like the color of the sun. Black is the color of a strangled rainbow. Exactly the color of my love. Black is the color of my true love's arrows. Black is the color of the cat. Black is the color of the nighttime mountains. Black is the color of the heavy stuff. Black is the color of the ribbon snake hanging over the lip of the face jug. Black is the color of outside my window, inky lumen in gray silkier modes. Black is the pattern on the woven snake's back. Pitch eye light slides coolly into night's ear. Inky muffled trees, shadow bloom punctuated by silver lights. Blue black bear paw, exactly the color of my blood. Black iris of my eye widening at night. And I have one of those face jugs that um, are made in North Carolina that like, apparently you know, they're sort of scary faces and they're Apparently, one of the stories is they were made to hold the uh, moonshine and alcohol so the kids wouldn't get into it. But there was actually, a, it really happened. A snake was, a big black snake was coiled around the face jug on the porch. I was like, wow. So I had to write about that. So, and um, I'm going to read a, some really sh short ones, a little series of really short ones. It's in a series called Microcosmos. Um, of course, named after the... Um, sequence of songs by Bartok. So but also like little worlds, microcosmos. So they're only like three lines each. On organic form. It's the tree's choice what the tree house looks like in the end. Oh, mushroom, please don't mind if a toad sits on you every rainy night. This two, my kids said those. Little by little, my sweater dresses turn into shirts. Another kid thing. Moonflower dies with first frost, but till then. Outrageous behavior, just sitting there doing nary a thing. Race car is a palindrome. The car of tomorrow has yet to be driven. The only joke I can remember. Why does the Madonna always look so sad in paintings? She was hoping for a girl. I got a smile out of you. Porch advice. You've written the poem. Hey, 
hell, might as well write the book. Just added some of them Roman numerals. Overheard at ballad lecture. Well, it's not dining table music. Little black boxes. When asked if she read music, quick as a snake, she answered, not enough to hurt my singing. Sheila K. Adams on the child ballads. When I went away to college, somebody asked me if I knew any child ballads. Yes, I answered. I learned them as a child. Working from history, cultures are ribbons you can get a hold of. I bet to do that. This is an acrostic wind. Willows draped down in the water near the blown down barn. And I wanted to read an excerpt. Um, wait, first I'm going to read this one. Um, this is one. Um, Augustus, and that's this white flower on the walls of the um, Offices and uh, it's it's it always I, I stay there in the summers and then it, when the sweet August clematis comes I know I have to go back to school that so smells really sweet but it's these little star like flowers but um this is this poem is sort of shaped like a river a little bit there's also a river at the bottom of the page that goes throughout the book and you sort of can jump into the river any time sweet August clematis. Hazy, snaky river road where white Carolina blossoms bloom in about three weeks from now, throwing off on the country air conditioned world, which means the windows are all rolled way down. A vine in heat dries, sorry, dries out half brown in front of the church on the wrought iron fence. We are up early these days waiting for the sun to skip its rocks up the river under the bridge it hit you like a snake. You're not willing to hit it in the middle of the black top sprawled out all the way across the winding river road. We are putting our arms and feet out to catch some air. It's so hot today, like the orange daylilies, like the orange prison suits worn by inmates picking up trash along the scenic byways, a rock outcropping, a long gun we hope is only for show held by the man in back in black, at least that was earlier when it wasn't quite so hot. What bothers me is something I can't quite pin down. And this is one about um, the equinox. There's two about the equinox. I think I'm gonna read three more. Um, two of them have tunes. This, this is more of a sonnet. Equidactyl honey sonnet. Hold ceremony in the everyday. Suspend in equinoctial honey. Drink your potion with intention. A poem can be descriptive medicine. You can catch for yourself and others in ever widening spirals. Seen and unseen couplets circle into DNA ladders. Eat something wild every day and you will become wild. Wild on the horizon, circular, the plants sing their songs of glee all around. So let us sing equally in night and day to hold mountains, time, balance deeper into the year. And the bottom river poem says, hand woven carefully because slower, the words chosen more. And then I'm going to sing the Equinox Hymn. Most of my books have a few poems that are sung. And this only has really two. Um, but of course, any of them could be sung. And, and speech is sung in another way. But Equinox Hymn. And I rewrite hymns a lot. So this is um, a rewrite of all hail the power of Jesus' name. So I made it over into a more pagan kind of earth song. Equinox hymn. All hail the power of equinox, earth, water, air, and fire. The noon sun beams his blessings down to wed him we aspire. The full moon beams her blessings 
down to wed her, we aspire. All rocks, all trees, all waterfalls, all passion flowers in light. Bring forth your flowery diadems to crown us day and night. Bring forth your flowery diadems and crown us day and night. All hail the power of equinox. Now day and night are one. The orbits of all heavenly spheres, all planets, stars, and sun. The orbits of all heavenly spheres are balanced now as one. And of course, it's not the equinox right now, but everybody... <laughs> yeah. new moon poem and the eclipse poems have to be rolling in right now because that happened yesterday. Yeah. Okay, and I'm going to sit. Uh, there's a very long poem at the end of the book, and I'm only going to read the the end because every time I read, try to read the whole thing, it takes the whole reading. But I'm going to jump into the very end so I can get to the part that's sung at the end, and it's a Somebody's been making a comment. Oh, hi, Summer. <laughs> um, um, it, it's got a song by somebody else. I'd have to look up the name. It's a the one of the. Um, I have to. I'll find it and I'll put it in the chat. But she's a state a poet laureate of like Tennessee or something. And I heard the song and I just stuck it in there like a collage. But it's a really cool song. So that's one thing that's good about readings that you can hear the tunes that are supposed to be in here. I haven't made the CD yet, whatever. Okay, okay, um, where should I start? She threw them on the table. A table is a repeating grid, not as the dog walks, but as the crow flies over complexity roads. Face turned toward the back of this photograph is marked seven stars wrong side out yellow made from peach leaves, seven stars woven, led her to collect weaving patterns, much in the same way that others of that era were collecting mountain songs. Broom, broom, sweep the room, break the warp of yesterday. Lasting beauty is unknown. Broom, broom, clean the corner, Make a place for my new love. Radiates out, eventually forming interlocking wheels. Robin, Robin, twirl the bobbin. Whirl the bobbin, sing, sing. Robin, Robin, fill the bobbin. Turn the black sheep's wool to gold. Shot through with riddle, riddle. Throw the shuttle. Warm the wall with April sun. The gift that started Allen stand. Room, room, scent of violets for the neck of his new coat. Linger, linger on my finger, little ring so shiny bright. And when all others failed, I took the footpath way. Linger, linger, oh my love in this coat of black sheep's wool. And then the river says, the ghost of festivals past, same with language. Water is a living thing. Water is a moving thing. Thank you. Thank you for publishing my book, Finn. <laughs> Thank you for having fence parties in this room. Yeah. Uh, more fence parties in the page poetry yeah party. we will definitely thank, thank you leanne. thank you leanne that was gorgeous oh my god uh and next we have patricio ferrari uh and i'm very excited to be publishing Patricio's poems in the forthcoming issue of Fence, which is issue number 40. 
and the poems are from a manuscript titled Mutter Buenos Aires. Uh, and Patricio recommends El Otro El Mismo by Borges. Uh, Obra Completa de Alberto Cairo, uh, and that's uh, Pessoa, Fernando Pessoa. Uh, he also recommends The Poet, The Lion, Talking Pictures, El Farolito, A Wedding in St. Roach, The Big Box Store, The Warp in the Mirror, Spring, Midnights, Fire and All by C.D. Wright, and Agua Viva by Clarice Lispector, uh, and Tierras de la Memoria by Phyllis Berto Hernandez. And uh, he translated Bitter Green by Martin Corliss Smith. Uh, so that's coming out as Verde Amargo uh, out of Buenos Aires poetry. Uh, he translated that with his mother. His mother's name is Graciela. Uh, and I'm so excited that he's here with us. Thank you, Emily, so much for sharing that and for having me here today and for featuring uh, the poems, but most of all for um, taking on the wonderful work that has been done for two decades by Rebecca and you and Jason just coming in and uh, doing a lot of work, putting a lot of hours uh, for magazine, magazine. Uh, events and and books forthcoming and to come and in, in, in an age that of dwindling linguistic diversity homogenization um, tightening of borders you, you you name it this is crucial with the work that that you're doing being here um the uh not just the the, the poets and uh, the fiction writers and the translators but the readers of of literature today are just crucial for for this uh in between and 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 beyond right the the um the, the borders and what what we are um living in this in this uh uh world and and day and age today um so i celebrate uh from from the heart the, the work of uh independent and, and small uh publishers like you mentioned at uh, tender buttons here uh with leanne and and the work of fence and and also buenos aires poetry uh in in argentina so i thought what i would do uh, if that's okay uh if i share my my poems it's just easier for me i didn't print them and I would have them. Uh, the lines would be coming, you know, on the on the screen as I as I read. And for those sure. who don't don't want to see, of course, you, you you can turn your screen off. And because I'll be reading in and out of of languages, and and basically, um, the uh, the poems that I'll be sharing are uh, all from Mater uh, Buenos Aires, which uh, is this uh, first volume within the else here. Uh, trilogy, which I've been working on now for for many many years, and it stems from um, from a, a few ideas. But the, the main the main one is is uh, linguistic diversity and um, and waters and water, of course, as as a metaphor, but also waters as a um, as an in between places, but as a continuation of places. And in Mater Buenos Aires, of course, I begin with the Atlantic Ocean and the, the Europeans coming into, into Buenos Aires at the same time they were coming to, to Rio, at the same time they were coming to New York City um, in the 1800s. Um, and in that book, as we enter uh, the, the, and we cross the, the ocean, and we enter the port, uh, we're also uh, within the, the mother's womb and we're coming into languages and, and into um, and, and across languages and into the vibration of, of languages. So in this uh, trilogy, but certainly more than in the other two volumes, I also uh, think about what the in-between uh, languages and translation 
So some, uh, at least two of, uh, at least one of the points we are uh, reading today, the the pro and poem that opens uh, Mater Buenos Aires is, is, is one that both celebrates my, my ancestors' lineage to Italian. So I begin uh, in Italian and I go straight into English, um, sort of as a handshake to show the reader what I will be doing, not just in Mater Buenos Aires, but in the, in the trilogy itself. So uh, let's see if I can uh, share. Um, the screen um, and and go straight into uh, yeah there it is. So I, I will start with uh, with poems by um, from Mutter. the The prose poem is the poem that will be uh, I'll only be reading one of the poems feature uh, in the Fence magazine. The the only prose piece that I will read is the one feature. And after a handful of poems from Mutter from different sections, I will read, I will close with uh, three, hopefully there will be time, translations that Mother and I did of, of the book that, um, that I fell in love with uh, right away when it came into my hands when I was in Providence in, in 2017 and five years later. Um, it is um, it is coming out in, in Argentina in 45 days. I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. Posa una intera parola con la sua bocca ancora premere le facce dall'alterno cerchio. Atro fu dal principio, dark it was from the inception, arc of a fine astral dwelling, arcana finestra dall'alto, sull'oceano suolo, or the ocean soul, in contrapeso, in, in counterweight, in uno scontro più a sud, one father, one farther soothing contour, neonato al cospetto, di evanescenti labbra nella calata del frammezzo. Ai, cerchi ancora. Ai, continue to seek. Ai, continue to seek. La calda contrazione, the calescent motherly call of the dead. La calda contrazione dei morti. Ancora, ancora. Ai, cerchi ancora. La calda contrazione dei morti. I continue to seek the calescent motherly call of the dead. Madonna, I will not try to remember the way it happened. This is neither a memoir nor a rendering of rain. Our ancestors heard the calling beyond moonhooks in the aqueous pits of ships across amniotic nights. To hear it now is to reach like a hand into the aft of time, the merge akin to brackish waters, a confluence of words and muck, so carries the deluge upon this earth. No arcs abound. Dark is the body of centuries of waters. When the only touchstone is a photograph, not just texture, grains of singularity, taught. I stare back at the world, taut skin, taut sails, generations passing like freight through a port. These sepia crossings peering into portholes of identity, faces whose names I was taught to pronounce, Maria, Mare, Aria, my forefinger traces the edge of each gaze, still there's no end. To unwind the course of time, you must take another year. Transient letters in airs, trade winds, windering, transatlantic ocean songs measure in syntactic knots and ache. Not quite a sound speaks tightly to the chest. Long knotted nights, sinuous pitch, a lens focused westward, steadfast, arterial Buenos Aires. Madonna di Bonaria, patroness of waters, rising, she lunges forward, the piers, the tidal patterns, you can hear her, her primal rhythms of waters, the mother fluency, old currents still churning, synchronic, four waters, a high pitch down the basin into the widest mouth, mother Buenos Aires, Madonna. 
Silver down, silver down water shadow swallows. Silver River Spanish, para Cristina Piña. Es una doña lengua de Castilla, itálicamente marítima, in murmuro mare, because the sea does, those two half tongues commingling, pell mell for the mouth on a slant, like canting ships, were from mestiza, half sudaca, half Latina, south decayed Latin, in a shanty tongue, not scant of breath, in moderata cantabile, latinge labia nostra, americanta minación, americanta minación, a mere contamination, a mere catenation, a canting amor of nations, a port's cant, a cantation, a canto, a cento. Accent is a mother. Milk of the newly delivered, still tepid and thick, a silver run. Noted la tuta note. Noted la tuta note, ferically night, the entire night. Now na ruginita note fluvia lenchita. This mesh your eye, morning conical chant in rusted light. Silver dark riparian forticity. If we mañana conico canto, I watercourse myself, me curso en madre ser. Note la tuta note ferically night. The entire noun, arruginita note fluvia lenchita, silver dark riparian porticity. If we mañana conico canto, I watercourse myself, me curso en madre ser. Crib is a dwelling that must not be like the rib of men that has long caged the eve of matria. Crib is a dwelling that must not be like the rib of man that has long caged the eve of matria. And I'll close with this uh, poem. Uh, throughout uh, the second part of, of uh, Mater Buenos Aires, we will be in different spaces, both um, towards the 1800s, mainly in music, uh, there will be uh, several tango pieces with which I do uh, either translations or um, homophonic translations or erasure uh, poems and off translations. And then uh, places that um, were both important for immigrants and others um, that are in the city for very uh, various different reasons. Uh, St. Ignatius uh, Church is the uh, first church in Argentina in Buenos Aires and one of the first ones in, uh, in Latin America. Dusk at St. Ignatius Church, Montserrat, just one of the oldest neighborhoods in Buenos Aires. Every angel is our childhood, but to what end? Between a mosaic of wounds, the spirit's contour estranged from the vernacular marble of lips. Listen to him in the almost inaudible intervals. The aisle's luster is a mirror you must traverse, footfalls to dispatch the fear that madness will creep upon you. True, he cannot save you nor extract the confession. My father's catatonic eyes, bird-like shrieks, fog thick scabs, stark rooms bereft of self, faces deformed, wandering derelict pavilions, our memory is a laceration of lilacs. When I, when I recall the past, it is dank cloister walls with a recluse whispering a faint, futile prayer. When I recall the past, it is dank cloister walls with the recluse whispering a faint, futile 
prayer. Fathering is an act of faith in for sin. And I'll close with three poems by um, this uh, book that from its very first line is unlike anything I had read then and, and perhaps since um, it uh, merges places, um, traditions, rhythms, a repertoire of, of metaphors from different centuries, poets that have been when, with, with Martin uh, across centuries and all um, uh, some of which uh, take place uh, in Boise and in, in the Middle East, um, uh, in the Midwest, I'm sorry, in the Midwest uh, of, of the US and then back to England. Ouvrir, ouvrir the nightingale. Ouvrir, ouvrir el ruiseñor. ¿Cómo se ha llegado a esto? El amor es un pie mutilado, cercenado hasta las tripas. Una nada lanzada al aire. Love is the tree. El amor es un árbol de damascos. All rotted. Completamente podrido. I can see, puedo ver. Eat, breathe, I think. ¿Cómo respira? Creo. How has it come to this? ¿Cómo se ha llegado a esto? The fruit, my bliss, the stain. El fruto que desechó mi dicha. A trifle shatter in the breeze. Una nada desecha en la brisa. Una nada desecha en la brisa. Slight as the ash tree bow, 12 of them in the chill, glint quite still and white, then black against the snow. Ligero cual rama del fresno, son doce chillando en el frío, destello en quietud y blancura, después cae oscuro en la nieve. A living form, why grieve? Un ser vivo, por qué hacer el luto? A living form, why grieve as if usurped by death until the farthest edge leaves one thin task left until the farthest edge leaves one thing task left un ser vivo por qué hacer el luto como si la muerte lo arrebatase hasta que el borde más lejano deje hasta que el borde más lejano deje un delgado de ver Muchas gracias. Thank you, everyone. And there's the invite for all of those who are friends both in the city um, or in the continent um, or anywhere in the US uh, that does not know uh, Martin Corliss Smith um, to, um, to get a copy of this book of fence and, and please feel, feel free to share, of course, the, the, the event taking place December 15th. Thank you, Emily and Jason and everyone present. And Leah and Eleni Brown here at Thorn Page in New York City. Yes. Thank you, Patricio. Thank you so much. And I love how you read both of the languages and that back and forth. That was just beautiful. Thank oh, you so much. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Patricia, that was amazing. Uh, it was. It felt so good to be moving fluidly among languages. Muchas gracias, um, thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for your work, both of you and, and everyone here yeah, thank you. For, for attending. Um, I'll stop. There you go. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. And hello was... to Lainey. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Lainey. Um, glad you could make it. Um, yeah. So. I guess we're going to come to our um, final reader of the night, um, who is someone who's uh, very uh, important to me as we went to our MFA program in Tucson, at University of Arizona together once upon a time and watching her writing uh, just and, and her kind of 
bravery and expansion just continue over the years has been just a privilege and an amazement. So Summer Browning, um, she, has, she also read at AWP at, uh, and the reading was like, like a superhero exploding in hilarious light. It was, uh, it was very memorable. Um, so Summer is reading Cheshfald Miyoj's Captive Mind, watching Endeavor, the BBC mystery series, is excited to read Michael Joseph Walsh's new book, Innocence, out with CSU Poetry Center, is always listening to Alice Coltrane, and is looking for a poetry reading gig in London, if anyone knows of a good living room bar bookstore. So my give you Summer Browning. Thank you, Jason. Very sweet, my friend. I miss you. Um, I'll read some poems from my new book, Good Actors. Um, I might tell some jokes too from my book here. Um, Telling jokes on Zoom always goes over really well. So yeah, maybe everyone could like take their uh yeah. If you want to take your, if you find yourself like laughing or wanting to like make sounds, you should put your mic on. <laughs> Unless that is gonna be too distressing. I don't know. I mean but it depends on I, the I think, sounds, doesn't it? Oh <laughs> right. I mean, I hope you don't get heckled. <laughs> <laughs> I was only heckled once <laughs> and my retort was shut up <laughs> beautiful <laughs> really good really smooth um so this one's called good actors i want to make a movie before i turn 45 about two characters exchanging money i give them directions i say to them earnestly as if holding grilled cheeses they push the money into each other's hands. I call out reluctantly. They look down and say, God damn it, this is the last time, Ray, and weave it between their fingers. They are good actors, so I say, hopefully. They blink and gaze into their hands like into a new baby. Angrily, I say, they gnaw the money to confetti. I tell them as if in mourning and the money fevers down their wrists. And now, like a bank, they fist and throw it like garbage. And a forest, now a forest, like seed, they sow it. You're doing very well, I say. They drop it at my feet. Exuberantly, I say, they remove their clothing. Lovingly, I say, they move toward me. They are such good actors. They turn off the camera. <laughs> Great things from the Department of Transportation. My mother desires to track my location on her phone. My mother announces that she's latex intolerant. <laughs> My mother is horrified that the children's cartoon character Caillou is bald. <laughs> My mother to the server at a terrible restaurant, I don't want a box, I want a flamethrower. <laughs> one's mother might be the most famous person one knows. My mother says, there is no Denny's, only Zool. <laughs> My mother on penises and traffic cones. On occasion, they're both orange, aren't they? <laughs> The young lungs of my mother fill with fine particulate matter on the streets of Clareton, PA. My mother on the X-rated hypnotist, he was only concerned with having the hypnotized persons act sexually stupid. <laughs> One night in the 1970s in the Mojave Desert, my mother ceases to feel apart from the world. My mother pays my sister and me $40 each to not have birthday parties. My mother's soulmate is not my father, but her dog, Six. 
The only thing I don't like about John Wick is that he never washes his hair. <laughs> My mother's father, a bipolar beer distributor, laughs at least once that I know of because it echoes through me for 40 years. I listen to my mother tell my child a story as if I were my own daughter. My mother tells me there were some skanks on America's next top model. My mother asks, didn't someone famous say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? My mother prays for her children every night. My mother prays for children every night. I bet you never thought you'd marry, have a baby and get divorced before you're 40, she tells me. <laughs> my mother expects great things from the Department of Transportation. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, life, a draft. Um, I'm actually trying to write a memoir in one-liners, and so I can <laughs> kind of consider this a prologue to that impossible, impossible project. Um, I want those trace amounts of narcotics in the water supply to take effect. I want to write a memoir in one-liners. I want to start a marketing company that unmarkets everything. I want to start a party bus company, but instead of buying a bus, I'll use the city bus. And instead of partying, we'll just be commuting. <laughs> I want to write a book so disgusting it makes over the shoulder sub, sub, sub over the shoulder subway readers puke on the people reading it. <laughs> I want this to be a very, very serious joke book. I want to start saying numb nuts a lot more. <laughs> to me, life is an infinite jerk off motion without beginning or end. To me, more wives wish their husbands dead and more husbands actually do it. To me, I'm surprised I'm still alive. An aphorist who hates aphorisms, a self-helper who hates the self. Every tornado begins as a cartoon dogfight. Mm -hmm. The joke is you're born. That's why they call it a delivery. Mm -hmm. Numb nuts. <laughs> Um, okay, well, that's, that's all. I don't know, should I tell some jokes here from this joke book? Yeah, yes. couple, couple minutes, I'll do. Um, I wish my to don't list was shorter. <laughs> um, there's an art to choking. The horrible <laughs> one. I own one more bra than most men. When we make love, I forget I make 75 cents to your dollar. I don't care, but in the most passionate way possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're having a midlife crisis when, oh, who fucking cares? <laughs> and then I have some, I have some charts in here too, if you can see. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> my favorite one is over here though uh, oh, where is it quick yeah <laughs> okay well thanks for letting me be a part of this and it was great to hear people read and i love fence and i hope you make a lot of money and sell that richard um print uh prince painting wait right yeah how did you get that um mm -hmm. it just appeared yesterday out of the, over the horizon yeah <laughs> It just Very flew cool. at us. Yeah. But thank you. That was He's an fantastic. artist who apparently wants to help some writers. <laughs> yeah. Good. Like, yeah. Yeah. Total surprise. <laughs> um, yeah. We'll, thank we'll you, try Summer. To find <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Summer. <laughs> we'll try to find you a London bar. Um, oh yeah, let's help Summer find a London bar. Yeah, like one of one of the two of the contributors 
like two issues ago or one issue ago, they're from London. So I'll ask. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Emily. Um, and thank you everyone for hanging out with us tonight. It's really been a blast and it's, uh, we should do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. oh, yeah. Thank you everyone I'm, I'm, so much. We're so grateful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. I'm sending hugs to all of you from my Astoria apartment. <laughs> yes, and um, I'm here in the suburb I grew up in, uh, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, uh, sending uh, lots of Where's love. Minna? Where's the kitten? The kitten is drunk and like flinging herself against the wall. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have this new kitten who hates me. She um, doesn't hate you. She's still well, coming up to you. She has some attachment issues. But uh, like she will just, she will go five, three feet in front of me. I will chase after her. She'll, she won't, I've never touched her. So um, that someday she'll let me be, she'll let me, she'll let herself be my emotional support animal that I need. But um, yeah, so we should wrap it up and um, thank you to everyone for being here and our, uh, total in the auction has jumped up through the event which is pretty cool and again like i don't know every once in a while we should have a fence cabaret night yes yeah all right well thank you everyone i guess um we're gonna sign out and uh we hope to see you again Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Buenas noches. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. Oh. Oh, oh my, my God. God. Oh, I'm going to stop recording now. Okay. <laughs>